Hi everyone and welcome to a virtual version of the new academic building at the LSE. As the Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Geography and Environment, I look forward to welcoming many of you onto the real LSE campus later this year. The purpose of this video is to give you a taste of a lecture from one of my undergraduate courses. I've chosen to focus on oil palm agriculture in Southeast Asia. The development of tropical forests for oil palm agriculture is a good example of complex interacting environmental problems, including deforestation, biodiversity loss, air pollution and climate change. These issues feature, feature across two of my undergraduate courses here at the LSE, GY120, a first year course on climate change, and GY220, a second year course on the interactions between environment and society. Both of these courses are a core part of our undergraduate degrees in environment and development, as well as environmental policy with economics. The courses are optional for our BA geographers and those taking geography with economics. Hopefully, in the next eight minutes or so, the title of this mini lecture will make some more sense. It's about how the products we consume here in the UK, or indeed wherever you might be right now, drive deforestation and the fires that often accompany deforestation and the resulting poor air quality that blights large areas of Southeast Asia for months at a time. When you think about air pollution, you might think about pollution from vehicles, if you live in a city, or maybe industrial sources. And yet, across, across the planet, the biggest cause of deaths due to air pollution is open burning of fuel for cooking or heating. If we look at this map, we can see that residential energy is the biggest air pollution killer across some of the most populated regions on our planet, including India, China, and Japan. Here in the UK, it's air pollution from traffic that is the biggest killer. But my research focuses on the tropics. And if we look to this region, you'll see that this shade of brown indicates that the biggest air pollution killer is biomass burning associated with wildfires and fires on agricultural land. I'm sure some of you will recognize these major cities, Singapore and Kuala Lumpur. Here we can see the iconic Marina Bay Sands Hotel and the Petronas Twin Towers, shrouded in haze, poor air quality that leads to many untimely deaths. Where is this haze coming from? Usually from Sumatra, across the Straits of Malacca, where the open burning of forests and agricultural land produces huge amounts of smoke. And how does this link to the products we consume? Palm oil. It is now almost unavoidable in the food and cosmetics that we regularly consume in our everyday lives. The consequences are not confined to the major cities that often make the headlines in the newspapers. The people living immediately downwind of these fires, often the poorest in the region, experience life-threatening air pollution. This is what it looks like on the ground, thick smoke that hugs the ground, and life must go on in these regions despite this horrific pollution. Some of you will be familiar with the anti-palm oil lobby, and yet the situation is far more complex than the simple labeling of palm oil as a bad commodity. After all, oil palms produce more oil per unit area than any other crop. Many of my research collaborators appreciate the importance of palm oil for development and bringing people out of poverty in the palm oil producing countries. And a lot of palm oil plantations are less environmentally damaging than alternatives. Instead, my research focuses on identifying the impacts of the least sustainable plantations, those that are driving deforestation in some of the world's most important carbon stores and biodiversity hotspots. I spent too much time in tropical lowland forests. This photo is taken from one of my field sites in Brunei on the island of Borneo. They're difficult places to work, hot, humid, and full of flora and fauna that have evolved to attack me. And yet, these unique ecosystems store vast amounts of carbon and are home to some of the world's most astonishing biodiversity. They maintain their own microclimates, staying wet all year round and preventing fires from ever burning away those important resources. Once humans bring deforestation and drainage to these environs, clearing the forest canopy and lowering the water table, all of those mechanisms that prevent fires disintegrate and the landscape becomes more susceptible to fire. The effects are particularly bad in areas with peat soil. P 
peat stores huge amounts of carbon and when it's dry it can smolder and burn producing particularly toxic smoke. When we look at a map of the forested area on the island of Borneo, divided between Indonesia to the south and Malaysia and Brunei to the north, we can see the scale of the deforestation and the replacement of those forests with plantations indicated by the darker colours in the animation. Notice the dramatic expansion in the southeast and southern parts of the island in Kalimantan and on the northern coast in Sarawak and Sabah. This is important because during dry periods, often associated with the El Nino climate phenomenon, we see widespread fires, the colourful areas on these maps in the deforested regions. More recently, we've seen fires in 2015 and again just last year in 2019. You can track these fires yourself using the Global Forest Watch Fire Tracker. There's a link just here. This tool allows you to compare the plantations on recently deforested tropical peatlands against those on more sustainable, longer term plantations on more sustainable soils. You can see for yourself that some plantations are more sustainable than others when it comes to these fires. My research interests were triggered by this fire event in 2013. Satellites in space observed the heat signatures of these fires on the Indonesian island of Sumatra just here. And imagery from the satellite show the smoke drifting across the Straits of Malacca to Malaysia and Singapore. And yet the forecasts of air pollution were dramatically wrong, underestimating the thickness of the smoke. It turned out no one had ever measured the composition of the smoke before from these types of fires. And the assumptions in the air quality models were badly wrong. This is where my field research fits into this story. In 2015, I traveled to Malaysia with some equipment for measuring the smoke. This is one of my field sites, a peat fire in Pahang on the Malay Peninsula. This is one of the strangest fires I have ever measured. There are hardly any flames, just smoke pouring out of the ground. You can see this by my feet. For the first time, we had accurate measurements of the composition of the smoke, and so the air quality forecasts could be improved. You can see here, it's a particularly dangerous kind of environment to work in. The heat was so hot coming from the ground below, from the fires burning into the soil, it managed to melt the bottom of my boots off. You can look up hashtag fieldwork fail if you're interested in these kinds of mishaps. Accurate measurements of the smoke are not only important for air quality forecasts, but also for accounting for the various greenhouse gases that enter the atmosphere during these fires including carbon dioxide and methane. Avoiding deforestation fires in this region could significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions and help mitigate climate change. This is a cornerstone of the United Nations Red Plus policy that aims to reduce emissions from deforestation and degradation by financially rewarding nations who maintain their carbon reserves rather than exploiting them. Accurate and reliable accounting of the potential loss of carbon through fires is essential to enable this form of financial aid to work well in this region. I wanted to finish with a note about what you can do about this environmental crisis. There are no lazy solutions to this problem, like banning all palm oil. That would simply divert pressure to other, even less sustainable solutions. Instead, it is important to identify the responsible producers, those whose plantations do not drive deforestation or peat fires. There are lots of scientists working with charities and NGOs to identify sustainable versus unsustainable palm oil. This is an extract from a report by Greenpeace. Activists have identified illegal deforestation in West Kalimantan on the island of Borneo. The company responsible for this deforestation is Sinar Mass, who directly supply palm oil to Nestle Indonesia. For the UK market, the supply chain is a bit more complex, with the palm oil sold to intermediary companies like Cargill, before ending up in everyday products like Nestle's Kit Kat. These reports by the World Wildlife Fund and the Union of Concerned Scientists are places where consumers can go to find out which brands are sourcing palm oil from sustainable producers. We can see the likes of IKEA, eCover, Ferrero Rocher and Unilever products all contain high levels of sustainable palm oil. Whereas Kellogg's, Avon, Ginster's and McDonald's either have 0% sustainable palm oil or do not disclose their supply chain. And so 
these are the worst players in the market. So this is the reason why your breakfast, lunchtime snack or lipstick might be driving environmental problems, including air pollution in Southeast Asia. If you'd like to hear more about our undergraduate programs at LSE or have any questions about this mini lecture, please get in touch. Follow our department on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram to get all of the latest news about our students and staff. I wish you all the best and hope to meet many of you over the coming years.